Okay, we're ready to get started. Good afternoon and thank you for joining us for the 2016 Department of Transportation Civil Rights Virtual Symposium, Speaking with One Voice, Accelerating Access to Opportunity. My name is Michelle Tesoro and I will be moderating for this session. Participants should be using the audio through the webinar room and only the presenters and myself will have speaking parts. Questions should be submitted in the Q&A box on the left of your screen during the presentation. For this session, questions will be answered throughout the presentation and at the end. Finally, this session and the entire symposium will be recorded. We will be posting recordings to the Departmental Office of Civil Rights website. Please check back for updates. Now, without further ado, it is with great pleasure to introduce you all to Chiron Robinson and Dr. L.J. Burks speaking on the topic of connecting primes to DBEs. Chiron was the director of the Pennsylvania Disadvantaged Business Enterprise Supportive Service Center, which provides services to help DBEs to compete with non-DBEs on an equal basis. He assisted DBEs in receiving over $550 million in contracts. In 2012, Chiron was recognized by the Federal Highway Administration for implementing innovative best practices for conducting supportive services and was selected to conduct a session at the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials 2012 National Service Rights Subcommittee Training Conference in Detroit, Michigan. Chiron has helped various publicly funded organizations successfully develop, monitor, evaluate, and improve their DBE programs. Some of the organizations that Chiron has helped include the U.S. Department of Transportation Mid-Atlantic Small Business Transportation Resource Center, Delaware Department of Transportation, Allegheny County of Pennsylvania MW DBE Department, City of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania School District, Pennsylvania Department of Transportation, and numerous MW DBE business owners throughout the Mid-Atlantic region. Chiron is a founding member and has been a managing partner of ProRank Business Solutions, LLC, since 2012, a consulting firm that specializes in helping publicly funded agencies and organizations plan, develop, implement, monitor, evaluate, and coordinate their business and workforce diversity programs. And now for Dr. L.J. Burks. Jay received a bachelor's degree in business administration from Morehouse College, a master of business administration from the W.P. Carey School of Business at Arizona State University, and a Ph.D. from the University of Maryland Eastern Shore. Jay is the senior manager of supplier diversity at the Comcast Corporation, where he is responsible for implementing policies and procedures to increase opportunities for diverse owned businesses in procurement. Prior to joining Comcast, he served as Executive Director of the State of Delaware's Office of Supplier Diversity, where he has helped develop executive orders and strategic plans to further the growth of supplier diversity in Delaware. Jay has a combined 20-plus years of experience in sales, marketing, entrepreneurship, supply chain management, procurement, and general management. In addition to his professional experience, he has taught both graduate and undergraduate courses for nearly 10 years as an adjunct professor at Lincoln University of Pennsylvania and is currently an associate faculty member for Ashford University. Jay is a board member of the Eastern Minority Supplier Development Council, the Reading Clinic, and serves as a corporate advisory board member for the United States Business Leadership Network. Welcome, gentlemen. We're both happy to have you both speak with us today. Great, thank you for those uh, introductions, and it's definitely a pleasure to be here. And we want to thank the U.S. Department of Transportation as well as Secretary Fox for ensuring that contract equity, civil rights, disadvantaged business enterprise program is at the forefront of economic development. And before we get into the the program or the presentation, I'd like to just ad lib here and, and let you know that. Kai and I, Kai Ron, I know him as Kai, we go back 30 years. Uh, I want to say Pop Warner football. We've both been entrepreneurs and selling door-to-door -door newspaper subscriptions. So if you feel a sense of familiarity in our discussion, is because we've been 
you know, friends for quite some time. We've both been to historically black colleges and universities. Kyle went to Hampton and I went to Morehouse. And we both started our civil rights careers at a historically black college and university, which is Cheney University. Um, one quick social media mention note, as you can see on our slides, we have my Twitter handle at LJAY Burks and Kai's Twitter handle at ProRank LLC. So let's get this conversation trending and let the social media space know that the Department of Transportation is committed to civil rights and supply diversity and equity and contracting. And you can hashtag it supply diversity. For today's agenda, we've already gone over some of the introductions. We're going to talk about the changing landscape of society and how minority businesses are increasing. We're going to talk about perceptions and unconscious bias. Uh, we're going to have some fun with Google searches. And we're going to talk about government contracting and entrepreneurs. And then finally, Kai is going to close with some action items for impact, best practices. And lastly, we'll close with an acronym. All good webinars, all good conferences have good acronyms. And the one we've chosen today is MANAGE. And we'll explain that when we close out. But MANAGE your supply chain to increase opportunities for diverse owned businesses. So I want you to put on your social logical research hats. Um, I did have an image up here, and we probably have some NPR fans on the line, uh, National Public Radio. There's a podcast called The Hidden Brain, and the social research specialist, Shankar Vedant, he's always talking about a conversation of life's unforeseen patterns. And I know some of us on the call may be very operational, logistics, let's get this thing done. But for the first few slides, I want you to put on your sociological research hats and think about the development and structure in human society and the collective behavior and how we impact each other. Uh, one quick disclaimer as I set the tone for our webinar today, I want to make sure that the stuff that we present, and I know we have some professionals on the line that different states have different jurisdictions. And before implementing some things, you definitely want to adhere to your legal policy, uh, consult your legal consultant to make sure the strategies that you're implementing are, if you will, legal. So again, I'm asking you to put on your sociological research hats and let's start the presentation. So we have a few questions, and I've, I saw a lot of folks dialing in. You should see a survey coming up in your dialogue box, and if you don't mind, I'd like you to answer, you know, how many years experience do you have with DBEs, Disadvantaged Business Enterprise, Civil Rights, so that we can understand our audience, if you will. Um, as Michelle said, you know, I have, you know, in excess of, you know, 10 years working with Disadvantaged Business Enterprises. I know Kai has about 7 to 10 years working with Disadvantaged Business Enterprises. So, if as the results come in, we have somebody with greater than 20, that's great. You know, that's fantastic. And as you can see, as I'm seeing the results come in, the landscape is changing, not just from an economic development point of view, but from an administrative point of view. Um, you know, with the landscape of society, the millennials, Gen Y, uh, Gen X, baby boomers are retiring. And you can see in the survey here, thank you for answering the survey, um, you know, we have less than five years. The majority right now are less than five years. Um, I'm going to go to the other poll. Next slide. Question two. There's only two polls because I kind of want to gauge my audience. And webinars are unique. We're often in front of individuals. You can gauge, you know, uh, who is in the audience. But with the webinars, they're unique. So the polls... I want you to respond with what you associate the disadvantaged business enterprise with. Oh, this is great. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Well, we have quite a few participants on the line. This is excellent. Now, I wish I could screenshot and save these results because I, I don't want to reveal them yet, but I may just reveal them. We're trending at... 41% entrepreneurship, 32% subcontracts, 10% job creation, only 6% bureaucracy, and only 5% innovation. That's very interesting. 
And one of the things I wanted to gauge is see who we had on the line with regard to administrators. But I saw a lot of folks dialing in. It seemed as though we had a lot of administrators on the line from different jurisdictions. So my next slide, thank you for responding to that survey. The next slide is kind of a history lesson, if you will. When the supplier diversity and disadvantaged business, civil rights, and contracting started, and this image here was the cover, unfortunately the image is not showing up, but it was the cover of a 1968 Newsweek. And in 1968, presidential candidate Richard Nixon pledged to make government promotion of African American capitalism critical to a civil rights platform and viewed it as a potential cure for urban problems. There was a lot of things going on in 1968. It was almost 50 years ago. We're in the Vietnam War. Dr. Martin Luther King and Bobby Kennedy were assassinated. Apollo 8 was the first manned spacecraft to orbit the moon. The African-American U.S. athletes took a stand in the Summer Olympics. Star Trek actually aired the first interracial kiss on America's television 50 years ago. And the cost of a Super Bowl ad was, believe this, $55,000. And the Super Bowl this year was about four and a half to five million dollars. So 50 years ago, I just want to put this in context, when the concept of African American capitalism and government contracting was created, if you will, in 58, these are the things that were going on. And if you fast forward to 2016, well, there's the... Newsweek slide with 1968, and you can see Mr. Nixon on there, and Bobby Kennedy, and Dr. Martin Luther King. So let's fast forward 50 years. And this is just setting the context of where supplier diversity, civil rights, DBE contracting, where the roots have began. 2016, the latest census data. It's no surprise that increased growth in minority-owned and women-owned businesses over the last two decades. You see the percentages in the slide. They have increased minority-owned businesses by 38 percent, women-owned businesses by 27 percent. Some of this information is coming from the latest census data survey of business owners from 2007 to 2012. And it's no secret that diverse businesses hire diverse individuals. So 50 years later, we're seeing the impact of entrepreneurship within the diverse business community. Unfortunately, disparities still exist. And if you look at the recent report by the Minority Business Development Agency, the disparity in wealth generation and wealth creation with minority business and majority business is still vast. Now, I hope you still have your sociological research hats on because we're going to get into the unconscious bias. Unconscious bias has been a top of many headlines as you can see, unconscious bias is not the silver training bullet, Google bias busting workshop. And a lot of the unconscious bias stems from HR, human resources, and Silicon Valley. And in Silicon Valley has been notorious. They've been, you know, amending some of their practices to, to increase diversity, but they've been notorious in underrepresenting minorities and women in some of these tech positions. There's no secret. If you just Google Silicon Valley and unconscious bias, you'll get so many headlines. But you ask yourself, what is unconscious bias? Um, and we all have these unconscious biases. These are hidden reflective preferences that shape most people's worldviews that can profoundly affect how welcoming and open a workplace is to different people and ideas. Now, we all know diversity leads to innovation, creativity. So unconscious bias are these hidden biases that we have in the way we react to individuals. And I have a screenshot of Google. Google has a great 90-minute video on unconscious bias, and we don't have time to show it, but it's fascinating. Dr. Well came up with a 90-minute lecture targeted specifically at the scientifically-minded Google employee. And they've done lots of research on unconscious bias. And some of you may have heard the research that was done with the resumes. And one resume had the same job experience as another resume. The only difference was one resume had an ethnic sounding name and the other resume had a generic name, if you will, a non-ethnic sounding name. 
and the resume that received the most, that received more views, a statistically significant amount of views, was the resume, mind you, they were all the same, except the names, the one with the non-ethnic name received more views. So Google has been taking a great leap into this whole unconscious bias phenomenon. And one of the things that Google um, you know, observed is an article in the New York Times that said one of the employees in the building noticed that all of the conference rooms were named after male scientists. So this is this unconscious bias. There's plenty of female scientists, but just naming the room convention can lead to those unconscious biases. Now this next slide kind of hits close to home, and this was a study done in 1944, and the traditional white doll versus the black doll, um, and the unconscious bias. And the children were asked to associate a doll with a particular feeling, if you will, or a particular perception. So when the child was asked, what doll represents good? What doll represents joy? What doll represents peace? The child selected the white doll over and over and over. When the child was asked what doll represents bad, what doll represents agony, terrible hurt, the child selected the black doll. Now this research was done in the late 50s, or excuse me, the late 40s. And recently the same study was done. And surprisingly, the child still associated the positive traits with the white doll. Now, the child is young and making these unconscious bias or implicit bias associations with the white doll versus the black doll. Why is that? And I encourage you, because we all have unconscious biases, I encourage you to Google implicit bias test. Um, and Harvard has a study which measures your implicit biases. And you will be amazed of the implicit biases you have. Gender, ethnicity, age, education, and the biases unfortunately can dictate our behavior. In the same context of unconscious bias, I did a little mini experiment and I said put your sociological researchers hat on. I googled economic development and we have a lot of practitioners um, and I've worked you know with supportive services I worked with the government and we have an economic development office um, and a lot of states have economic development offices and you google and you see these images and these images are fascinating you have alternative energy you have planting seeds planting money you have scientists it's an action-packed slide, economic development. So I said, okay, how about Googling entrepreneur? And it's the same reaction. You have slides with ideas, global, creativity. They're really action-oriented slides. So entrepreneur and economic development. And then, you know, the survey that we took early on, and I asked you what word associates with disadvantaged business enterprise, a lot of you indicated that it was entrepreneurship, which was great. And I, that leads me to believe you may have a lot of practitioners on the phone, but when you Google disadvantaged business enterprise, the images, again, aren't as fascinating as economic development and um, entrepreneurship. Why is that? And does that drive some unconscious biases when describing the program? So which coloring your perception? You know, I chose this slide here because when you have individuals talking about the disadvantaged business enter pro enter enterprise program, are they talking about job creation? Are they talking about the exciting innovation and creative things that the disadvantaged businesses in the program are doing? Are the images, are the news feeds, are the sound bites coloring your perception? So we're all in a critical position to color the perception of the disadvantaged business enterprise. And that survey we took initially was great because we said that entrepreneurship comes to mind. 
So I challenge all of us on the call today. You know where we are, but we, where we can be. The program, I've seen some great programs. Um, and Kai will talk about some best practices coming up. But we can be so much further, I think, with regard to just perception. We have access to the latest and greatest technologies. We have access to a whole business community. We have access to so much data that we can positively continue to increase the positive perception of the DBE program. So my doctoral dissertation, which was exploring, examining the relationships between entrepreneurial orientation, procedural justice, and entrepreneurial leadership, and the reward and performance expectancies of minority and women-owned businesses in government contracting. Now, that's a mouthful. But the, the dissertation was almost common sense. If an entrepreneur perceives the program to be procedurally just and innovative, you're going to attract entrepreneurial-oriented-minded individuals. And this was based all on the social cognitive theory. And social cognitive theory, again, the sociological researcher had on, is three factors, environment, people, and behavior that constantly influence each other. Behavior is not simply a result of the environment and the person, just as the environment is not simply a result of a person and behavior. So the way we talk about programs, the way we position programs, the way we market programs, this is impacting how people react within the program. And then finally, my research takeaways were what I said initially. Increased perceived fairness increases participation. And entrepreneurial leaders have high expectancies. So if we're looking to capture that talent and capture those innovative DBEs, prime contractors, we have to be perceived as being innovative, entrepreneurial, and procedurally just. But this is consistent with what we discussed and how unconscious bias is potentially impacting the success and the effectiveness of the DBE programs. This is a study that was done by you know, the New Jersey Department of Transportation, who I saw was on the call, and some of the quotes that they received from the majority of prime contractors in the perception, we are rated for our ethics. The prime rating is going to suffer because of the work of a subcontractor. DBEs often underestimate the amount of work that could be required and comply with all the DOT requirements. Now, this, these responses clearly show that there's some challenges with the perception, the DBE, and the prime community. Now, if we look at the DBE subcontractor and the DBE bias, you can see that this is still there. Normally, they contact me, those who need a minority firm. We do not have any specific marketing efforts. The owner of our company is known in the industry. You know, we approached a few companies. We sent out 50 letters. Once I'm a DBE certified, the majority of firms will have to use my firm. There's a unconscious bias that once you certify and become a DBE, and we see this within, you know, the corporate world, that once you certify, oh, everybody's going to come, you know, banging on my door for opportunities. So the misperception or the unconscious bias, which is enhanced by some of the actions that are taken within the industry is permeating the results of DBEs and primes and working together. And these slides, we're going to continue to cover some of the best practices. And so partnering DBEs with majority primes and overview. So the best practices for DBE program administrators and the best practices for DBE and majority primes, you know, supportive services, administrative support, and financial assistance. There he is, financial assistance. Great. So, Guy, we're on uh, slide 21, and I think this is a great chance to, you know, introduce you to give some of the best practices that I kind of top-leveled um, and, and continue on. Well, thanks a lot, and I'd like to apologize for the technical difficulties. I'm glad that we were able to work through those and, and get everything together. And uh, you did an excellent job, Jay. I think that you hit on, on a lot of key points that are going to be helpful to a lot of folks. And now we're going to cover some best practices, and the primary purpose of this section of the presentation will be to provide ideas and strategies that will help partner more DBEs with majority prime contractors. Now, as we move to the next slide, uh, from my personal experience, uh, both as a DBE program administrator 
as well as a certified DBE consulting business owner, I find, and the research also suggests, that the primary factor that prevents majority primes and DBEs from working together most often is a lack of trust. And um, there's this misperception, uh, as Jay was speaking to, that you know, uh, somehow when primes use DBEs, they're risking their reputation and their profitability when they work with those you know, new, unproven uh, DBE firms. And many DBE subcontractors feel like they're risking receiving slow or no payment by working with unfamiliar primes. So as we move to the next slide, again, uh, lack of trust is something that is uh, a big obstacle that we're going to need to help DBEs and majority primes kind of overcome to effectively partner. Now, I'd like to start by discussing a very exceptional survey that was done by the New Jersey Department of Transportation in 2008. They conducted a study to identify barriers of underutilization by DBEs concerning majority prime contractors. And the biggest reason for DBE underutilization that they found in this study was a lack of relationships. When both majority prime contractors and majority prime consultants were asked what was the, the, the two most important factors in selecting subcontractors, they, they stated that first was the experience of the subcontractor, and second was the reputation of the subcontractor. And again, speaking to some of the, the points that Jay had made earlier. Hey, Kai, this is Jay just chiming in. You said the reputation, and now how reputation with what? And this is, you know, kind of a rhetorical question, but how does one measure a rep reputation in the community, reputation and work performance? Isn't that experience? That's something that's tough to measure, right? Right, and it's something that's probably more perceived than tangible. So you're exactly right about that. Now, as we, we go to the next slide, uh, DBEs actually felt that the most important factor in them being utilized was having the track record, excuse me, with prime contractors. And the research that New Jersey conducted found that three-fourths of prime contractors who had used certified DBEs for the first time actually maintained a business relationship with those firms after successfully using them. So let's go to the next slide. Another piece of important research that was conducted in 2008 was research that was conducted by TRB, the Transportation Research Board. They conducted a national DBE program manager survey. Some of you folks that have been in the program for a while might have even participated in this survey. And what they were doing was gathering the most important problems that face the DBE program. Now, they found a few uh, problems that particularly pertain to this presentation today. The first one being that majority prime contractors were not eager to work with DBEs. The second major finding was that prime contractors are reluctant to use new DBE subcontractors. And you can imagine, we can go to the next slide, but you can imagine if, if these firms are already reluctant to use any new subcontractor, if that new subcontractor happens to also be a DBE who has a negative stigma attached to them, how hard it would be for, for DBEs to overcome these barriers. And that's really the purpose of the DBE program. Now, in 2011, the Transportation Research Board uh, conducted a follow-up uh, report called Synthesis 416. And I see that a lot of the, the folks on this call today have actually been, been involved with the program for less than five years. So this is a great, great resource for you to take a look at. We have the link right here in the presentation. And what this, what this report did, what TRB did with this report, is take all of the program issues that they identified in 2008, and then they, they rated the effectiveness of 22 race-neutral measures that were used by four 47 states to overcome those issues. So again, we'll move to the next slide, but I wanted to make sure that the participants of this call had access to that research, because it's great research. And one of the primary things that they, that they covered in that research 
was actually connecting primes with DBEs, facilitating meetings and networking between DBEs and prime contractors. About 96% of the states identified uh, this strategy as being helpful, and respondents wrote more comments about that particular strategy in the 2011 TR TRB report than any other strategy. So what that means is that there is a lot of information. There's documented models and best practices on how to implement Meant, you know, partnering majority primes and DBEs. Tom, yep. real quick, I remember, you, you know, we were talking about this last night with facilitated meetings and networking. That was the number one response, and that is difficult. I go to so many networking events, and it's a challenge to even get out of the shell and network and say the right things, and, you know, that really takes a lot of training, and that's that whole unconscious bias. A lot of the primes, they're not marketers. They're, you know, trade specialists. So to all the administrators on the call, that is something that is a really key. Now, these next slides, I believe, Kai, are really heavy with best practices. And I think we're going to just cover the top themes of each slide with regards to the best practices. Okay. In the interest of time, I think that that's, that's a great idea. And uh, we didn't get a chance to cover it. We kind of were having technical difficulties. But uh, what we did is we broke the best practices up into two primary groups. Uh, the first group being best practices for DBE program administrators, and the second group being best practices for uh, DBEs and majority prime contractors. So we're going to go ahead and kick off the, the, the portion that covers best practices for DBE program administrators, and then a, a kind of a subgrouping uh, for DBE program administrators would first be discussing uh, best practices regarding supportive services and, and training. And these best practices are centered around helping DBEs prepare for uh, encounters with majority prime contractors and also bidding on, on contracts and also when they are actually selected and they're, they're selected for contract utilization, how to help them successfully perform these contracts. And I just want to touch on the last bullet for this particular slide. Uh, being a program administrator in Pennsylvania, one of the challenges that we, that we faced and we were able to overcome a lot of the times was helping DBE firms with technology and uh, electronic bidding processes and also conducting business over the Internet. But what we found there are that a lot of those actual firms would like to send their admins to the training. You know, and what we had to do was encourage the DBE business owners to also come with those administrative assistants or those other key personnel that they were sending because ultimately what would happen would be if the, you know, the administrative help or the admin or whoever they sent to that training, if they left the company, then that skill set and that knowledge left the company with them. And they found it you know, hard to actually understand how to bid or how to work the DOT's electronic bidding system. And that, that's something that could cripple the company. So let's move to the next slide. Something that was hugely successful as a, as a program administrator in Pennsylvania was a program that we implemented to help reimburse DBEs for targeted technical trainings and assistance. This program was called PADBE University, and what we did was help DBEs pay for classes, trainings, and certifications that made them more applicable or, or gave them different skill sets relating to the transportation industry, and we were able to reimburse them as long as they showed us that they successfully completed the class and that they already paid for the class. And what we found, another uh, kind of unintended benefit, was that we were actually increasing the enrollment of non-traditional students of many local uh, institutes of higher learning and training and trade organizations. And what those institutes of higher learning were doing were actually building dorms and curbs and parking lots and sidewalks. And what they were able to do was actually leverage a lot of the prime contractors that were bidding for their work to utilize the DBEs that were participating in their training classes and we were able to help DBEs gain some of that key experience that we identified as key to helping them get projects. Let's move to the next slide, please. 
Next, what we're going to do is, is take a look at some best practices regarding administrative support that DBE program administrators can provide. And again, to touch on what Jay said earlier, when you look at administrative support uh, best practices, you have to keep in mind that these sometimes can impact other departments, like your contracting department. You have to be you know, kind of sensitive to the resources that they have and make sure that they're on board. You also want to check with your legal counsel, and you may, need, you may even need to get a program waiver from your respective federal administration in some cases. But something that you can do without a lot of buy-in and support from other, deport, uh, other departments and other agencies would be to actively track participation uh, participation of DBEs on projects. And if you find that a prime contractor uh, is below uh, average in their DBE usage or they're behind with regards to their DBE participation, that's a great opportunity to partner them with DBEs. Because in those situations when that prime contractor may be facing some kind of financial uh, uh, penalization for not utilizing the DBE or not meeting their goal, they're going to see an immediate need and an immediate value that that DBE brings to them in working on that project. And after that DBE performs successfully, hopefully you will have not only made a new relationship for that prime contractor for the current project, but hopefully they can continue that relationship moving forward. Let's move to the next slide, please. Uh, something else that can be done uh, as far as administrative support that can be provided, and this was rated very effective in the 2011 TRB uh, research that was done, would be contract unbundling and small business set-asides. And again, this is an example of something that you may need help and buy-in from other departments. You may need approval from your, your legal counsel or your legal guidance, but um, this helps DBEs and small businesses alike to directly get firsthand experience that can be used to then go back and leverage contracts with uh, other majority prime contractors. And something to think about as far as the, the small business set-asides is that as long as you're implementing small business set-asides in a race-neutral manner, it's completely, you know, completely within the, the scope of 49 CFR. If you wanted to do a set-aside that was gender or race conscious, you might need to get a program waiver from your respective federal administration. So it's just something to keep in mind. Next slide, please. Now, uh, Something else that, that is often done by DBE program administrators, best practice-wise, are marketing and outreach best practices. And these best practices are primarily designed to help DBEs connect with majority primes and help them foster and maintain those relationships moving forward. And one of the number one things that DBE program administrators can do is facilitate one-on-one -on -one interactions, face-to-face -face meetings between majority primes and DBE firms. And again, we have a list of ways that that can be done, but as Jay said earlier, sometimes these meetings can be awkward, so as the DBE program administrator, you want to make sure that you're facilitating meetings that feel natural, that are productive, that you can kind of help the, the, uh, the networking move along, if you will, because it just might not be the forte of the groups that you're bringing together. Next slide, please. Something else that's, that we found uh, to be personally and also uh, from a program administration uh, uh, perspective to be amazingly beneficial is publicizing new DBE firms to prime contractors and newsletters and emails, as well as uh, publicizing the accomplishments of DBEs and DBE newsletters and emails. That would, again, speak to helping DBEs acquire that reputation that primes are looking for to utilize those DBEs. And I mean, to give you a firsthand account of how beneficial it can be, uh, when we first were kind of getting started in 2013 with ProRank, uh, we have won as a prime contractor and uh, a contract with the Delaware Department of Transportation to review their DBE and their OJT supportive service programs. And what DelDOT did for us was they actually promoted that in their DBE newsletter and circulated that to the DBE community. And we found that to be hugely beneficial. It helped us not only get opportunities with other agencies and organizations, but it helped us build that positive reputation in the local DBE community. And at the bottom of this slide, you can also see that uh, we're 
one of the other major things that DBE program administrators can do is facilitate financial assistance programs, and that really will help DBEs build capacity and have capacity to execute projects. Now, these can be tricky because they often require a buy-in from a third-party financial institution, and you know sometimes they can be kind of tricky to maneuver. So again, I'm going to refer you back to that Synthesis 416 report because you have a number of instances reported, different programs, different models that you can review, and you even have an excellent case study in that report that will talk about the, the ins and outs of implementing a program, uh, the successes and the challenges. So again, uh, take a look at that synthesis report from TRB, and that will really help you out with implementing financial assistance programs as well. Next slide, please. Hey, Kai, we got our first question here. Um, and I'll read it, and you know, I defer to you as the subject matter expert. I have some thoughts here. Um, sure. How can you give consideration to prime contractors who utilize DBE firms even without a project goal if contracts are awarded to lowest responsible bidder with or without DBE goal? Well, there are some innovative things that you can do. Uh, now, I, I believe that uh, New Jersey was doing something, uh, New Jersey dot, that has recently, they had to stop. But what they were doing was they had a point system for the utilization of new DBEs first time. And what I think that, uh, a way that I think that you might be able to implement that is by requesting a program waiver. If you can show a definite disparity for uh, either a, a, a group, you know, whether it be gender or ethnicity, you know, then you can actually request a program waiver with your federal administration and you can do some very creative things that might not normally be approved by 49 CFR. So that would be one way that I would suggest to, to possibly implement that strategy. Did you have any thoughts on that, Jay? Oh, I think you nailed it in the, the uh, spirit of time. You know, we have about 15 minutes and a few more slides. Okay, all right. Now what we're going to do uh, really quick is cover some best practices for DBEs. And again, what you want to do is you want to be, if you're a DBE and you're trying to get work, you want to be a hunter, not a gatherer. That's a phrase that me and my partner that run pro Rank Business Solutions, my partner Wade West, we always tell firms, you want to be a hunter, not a gatherer. You want to go to projects proactively in the system, the bidding system of the State Transportation Agency. You want to find the list of plan holders and you want to pr provide them with quotes proactively. All right? Don't sit back and wait for them to, to send you some kind of fax or some kind of email asking for your participation. Another thing that you want to do is you want to develop a specialty niche. The New Jersey DOT survey in 2008 found that both majority prime consultants and majority prime contractors were more likely to use DBEs that had a specialty niche to expand their own scope of services rather than hire DBEs as subcontractors that do the same work that they do. So that's something that you definitely want to do. You want to request face-to-face -face marketing meetings whenever possible, whether you're doing that by cold call, whether you're doing that face-to-face uh, -face by meeting and, and making relationships at pre-bid meetings, whether you're sending out emails, and you want to try to build relationships with project managers and estimators with the, the majority prime contractor, often they'll have more than one project manager, they'll have more than one estimator. So the more relationships that you have with those folks, the better off you're going to be. Next slide, please. Now, a few more key best practices that we found uh, would be joining local trade and business organizations. They not only give you an opportunity to meet uh, individuals that could be potential clients, but they'll also give you an opportunity to possibly have a support system in case you encounter some kind of trouble or some kind of issue. And also, you want to make sure that you're utilizing your local uh, DBE supportive service program because what you want to do is make sure that you have others uh, invested in your success. For example, if you're part of their, their business development program, they're literally tracking your growth and reporting that as a metric. And the more successful you are, the more successful they are, you know. And that's, that's what you want to do. You want to utilize the resources that are out there for you because a lot of the publicly funded agencies have programs that are, are literally vested in your success when you utilize their services and their resources. Next slide, please. Now, 
Uh, in the spirit of time, I'm just going to touch on the final bullet point here for DBEs, and that's going to be embrace technology. Uh, technology is a way to, to turn what's often viewed as a weakness into a strength. A lot of times, if you're a DBE, you don't have a lot of staff. You don't have a lot of personnel. So if you embrace technology, you can actually achieve a lot more with less. That's the whole purpose and point of technology. And now, if you're achieving the same or more with less staff and less personnel, that's going to get passed on to your client, your client as a more competitive quote, a more competitive bid. And I mean, I can tell you about this firsthand, ProRank Business Solutions, we have, we have beat out so many larger prime consultants uh, that are more tenured, that have more folks, because we were able to implement technology in the delivery of our proposals, um, and as well as use technology to achieve the same the same amount of uh, productivity that our, co our competitors were able to, but we were able to do it at a lower price, at a more feasible price for our clients. So that's huge. Don't keep doing things the old way. Look for new ways to embrace technology, make new models, and use systems. Next slide, please. Now, um, a few best practices for majority prime contractors. Uh, first, we want to recommend that majority prime contractors utilize their DOT DBE programs to help solicit their, their projects. You know, when, when you're looking for DBE participation and you have a bid solicitation, who better to send it to than your local DBE Supportive Service Center or your DBE Program Administrator who can give it to their DBE office and let them blast it to their entire database. And this will almost guarantee that you get quotes back for DBE participation, but if you don't, these end up a lot of times being the same folks that are going to evaluate your outreach efforts. So who better to involve in the process from the beginning than those folks that might end up evaluating the effectiveness of your outreach at the end of the day anyway. Um, also, we recommend that majority primes maintain their own database of subcontractors. Um, if you're working in a, in a state that does not have uh, a pre-qualification process, it's a great way to kind of keep tabs on who has successfully performed and what they've done and who hasn't. Also, if you're receiving quotes from DBEs for skill sets that you don't necessarily work in at this time, you can keep those on file and you can use that to complement your skill sets and expand your services later down the road when you need to. Um, also, you want to partner with DBE trade groups. Uh, this will keep you uh, keep your finger of the, on the pulse of what's happening in the DBE community and also it will help you find new DBE subcontractors that you probably never even knew existed. Next slide, please. Hey, Kai, you presented a lot of information, and we're getting some questions that are popping in here. Um, what you had in slide 34, I believe, LOP. 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 I'm, and, and I'm sorry, and there, there's a lot of uh, the acronyms in this industry, and LOP stands for List of Plan Holders. And again, ah. that's normally going to be the list of folks that are planning to bid a contract. And that, that we spoke to that when we're asking DBEs to be proactive, to get that list of folks that are planning to bid on that project and go ahead and solicit them proactively, send them quotes. So that's what the LOP is. And then finally, we have one more question here about, and I know we're pushing up on 4 o'clock, um, when you talk about requesting meetings with key DOT personnel, um, give us a quick 30 second on which strategy would a Definitely. DBE exercise? Definitely. The DBE would, if, if they don't want to reach out directly to uh, the DOT to, to keep personnel there, they can reach out to their supportive service program. I know when we were in Pennsylvania, we, this was very beneficial for consultants. And what we would do is we would set up meetings with uh, some of the key personnel in the consulting department uh, with, with PennDOT, and we would have DBEs come and present to them and get to know them. And what DBEs can do is actually leverage those relationships and those meetings when they're talking to other prime consultants or other prime contractors and let them know that some of the folks that are going to be making the decisions about who to utilize are already aware and familiar with their firms. And this oftentimes, especially in consulting, because in, in construction it's often low bid, but in, in, in consulting a lot of times it's best value. And one of the first processes to select a consultant is determining, is selecting the best team. So uh, prime consultants sometimes will be apprehensive about using new DBEs that aren't familiar with
with key personnel at the at the state transportation agency. So that's that's an idea of you know how DBEs can request that, but also how DBE program administrators can facilitate you know that request and really help DBEs to kind of build their reputation. You know, hey Kai, that's what you were alluding to there. You're definitely on a roll, and, and I hate to interject. We have six minutes, and we have two more questions. Um, can you elaborate on specialty niches? And when you talk about DBE trade groups, I'm familiar with some of the construction trade groups, um, but if there's anything else you'd like to add so we can save time for our acronym. Right. Well, you have, you have a plethora of skill sets that you can perform. Um, you have ancillary skill sets that support you know, maybe the, the primary, and there's a lot of different modalities on here, but, you know, and I don't want to say, you know, the common stuff like flagging and landscaping, but there are certain portions of, of projects that you can actually become proficient in that, you know, the prime contractor might not be focused in. And if, and if you're a DBE, if you can identify whatever industry you're in or, or how, whatever modality you're working with, if you can identify those niche skill sets that, you know, oftentimes are overlooked and you can become proficient at that, then you can bid that skill set successfully to a prime. You find a prime that doesn't normally perform that skill or that trade, and then you can partner with that prime to help them expand their scope of services. And I'm sorry, Jay, what was the second part of the question that you asked? And I think we addressed it with the, with the trade groups. Um, okay. Traditional construction agencies, um, exactly. construction organizations, and if it's a specialty organization, I think you addressed that. And, um, and, and I, let, me, let, me end, uh, let me hit one bullet point on this final slide, and that would be um, a lot of times there's a stigma that, that prime contractors, when they hire a DBE, they kind of have to leave them out there on the island. They can't help them at all because of a violation of commercially useful function uh, rules in 49 CFR. And I just want to drive home the fact that as long if a DBE does find themselves in a position where they need assistance from a prime, as long as that assistance that the prime is providing falls within normal industry practices that, and it does not, you know, affect the DBE's ability to control or remain in, control the work or remain independent, then the, the prime is allowed to help that DBE as they would help any other subcontractor. So we don't want to create an environment that makes it tougher for DBEs to succeed. And I just wanted to take time to say that because that's something that I used to hear a lot well, as well as a program administrator. And that was excellent. Um, and, and are we ready to go to the next slide? We're ready to go to the final slide. Oh, the acronym, fantastic. You know, one question, Kai, that was asked, um, how can we graduate DBEs to become primes? And I think, you know, the whole theme of this webinar, speaking with one voice and getting the DBE to graduate to a prime, first of all, is not associating a DBE with subcontracting, and just some of the natural tendencies that if you're a DBE, you're automatically a sub. I think reversing that framework, that mental framework, gets us on common ground. But there's some definitely tactical things that you can do. Do you have any real quick getting a DBE to become well, a prime? Well, I would say administratively, Jay, absolutely. One of the best things we can do is we can try to unbundle projects, and we can we can help DBEs get that experience bidding as primes and building that capacity on smaller projects. And what that's going to do is give them the experience that often other prime contractors are looking for, but it's also going to get them familiar with the ins and outs of contracting with the DOT, help them get, you know, build some capacity. But let's keep in mind, even the, the firms that we call prime contractors are going to be subs on, on, on jobs. So subcontractor and prime contractor is a term that's only relative to a project, you know, and the, and the largest prime that you know will sub given the right situation. So if we're talking about graduating DBEs from the program altogether, what we want to do is, is help them build capacity, get more and more work so that they can graduate either regarding either uh, via the, the gross receipts limit or the personal net worth limit. And then we understand that, you know, all, all 
all construction firms especially, they're going to subcontract at some point. So, you know, as long as the DBE can build capacity, they can be successful, we want to be able to help them compete ultimately without the need of the DBE program. And they, you know, they might prime some contracts, they might sub some contracts, but I think that that's more what we're speaking to, trying to help firms be able to compete without the, the actual support of the DBE program and still be competitive and still be successful. Hey, Kai, we got the two-minute warning, and you definitely have warmed the participants up because the questions are flooding in. So our Twitter handles are in the presentation. The presentation will be posted online. Um, we can definitely address some of these questions um, offline, um, but we definitely want to wrap up um, and want to thank you know the participants for listening. Um, but I told you I would give you the acronym. So the acronym is Manager Supply Chain to increase opportunities for diverse vendors. And each letter you can implement with staff, personnel, primes, subcontractors. For example, you want to motivate. How do you motivate your team? How do you motivate primes? How do you motivate the DBE community, administrators? Advocate. You're all advocates in the DBE program. But how do you advocate for DBEs? How do you advocate for primes that are supporting DBEs? You want to navigate. You want to provide tools to help some of the DBEs as well as the primes navigate those relationships and those networking opportunities. Having someone help navigate a room with 200 primes and 50 subcontracts, that's very difficult. So you want to take us home with the last three letters, Kai? Yeah, and let's, let's talk about allocate. You know, you want to allocate resources, whether they be time resources, human resources, financial resources. Let's allocate resources to ensure that we have successful partnership between majority primes and DBEs. Then we want to generate. You know, we definitely want to generate opportunities, opportunities for networking, opportunities to learn, opportunities to help DBEs build capacity, and opportunities for, for DBEs to gain visibility. And finally, we want to make sure that we evaluate. You know, my company ProRank has, has performed uh, a number of program evaluations, and it's important to evaluate qualitatively, quantitatively, to evaluate the metrics, to evaluate prime contractors on their DBE utilization regularly, and to also evaluate the perceived barriers that are encountered by DBEs. And this information gathered is critical to helping us improve our relationships between majority primes and DBEs.